I wonder what the very first thing you thought of this morning when your eyes opened for the first time. What was the very first thought that went through your mind when your eyes opened? Mine was, why did I set my alarm so loud? That's annoying. I didn't expect that. It was jumping, uh, startling. Um, what was your very first thought? I, I want us to connect um, back in time to the disciples of Jesus and the many women disciples, what might their first thought have been when their eyes opened on this day in history, the Sunday after the Passover that Jesus died? When they opened their eyes, I wonder. The scriptures say they were in a lot of fear. They were in a lot of confusion. I wonder if one of the first thoughts that go and that went through their mind wasn't did Jesus speak the truth? Was all that he said true? I mean, if you remember with me, I'm sure you, they were recalling all of those things that he said as far back in the beginning of our gospel accounts when he met with Nicodemus. He said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so the Son of Man must be lifted up and I will draw all men to myself. And God so loved the world that he gave me his only Son that whoever would believe in him will have eternal life right now. And whoever believes in me crosses over from death to life. Indeed, I am the life, the truth, the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the one that's coming down out of heaven from the Father. Manna in the Old Testament, but it's me now. I am the good shepherd. I call my sheep by name, and they listen to my voice. I am the door of the sheep pen. I protect and guard them. I am the light of the world. I wonder if they said, is all that Jesus said, was it true, was it real? Because he over and over again said, if anyone believes in me, inside their soul, it will be like a torrent of living water that satisfies them from the inside out, over and over. I am the vine, my father's the vine dresser, you are the branches, you stay connected with me. You will bear much fruit. I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you will never die. And even if you die, you will see life. All of these things, was it true? Was it true? I wanna celebrate with you the narrative in the Gospel of John of this day. Do you know that we gather on this day, Sunday, because of that resurrection event? It transitioned the day of the gathering of the church. And we literally are and exist today as the church because of that day. It is the center of the Gospel message. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we all ought to go home. Gospel um, all would be meaningless. Paul says it. Without that, we are hopeless. We're still in our sin. And there is a centrality to this event that we want to celebrate today. And I want to do that by looking in the Gospel of John through the, two, the stories of two people. A misunderstood woman and a mischaracterized man. Can we do that together in John chapter 20? It's one of my favorite stories of Jesus' resurrection. It doesn't focus so much on the fact and the event of Jesus' resurrection as does the other gospels. Even though we're never there to see it, what it was like, it focuses on the truth of it through two people, a misunderstood woman and a mischaracterized man. So let's look in John 20. We'll take them one by one and then I'm gonna show you some art to try to capture your heart and mind in these events. And uh, so that we can continue to just behold Jesus together, all right? John chapter 20, this is the misunderstood woman. Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were coming, they were, they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. It's funny that John is writing this and he just said, just want you to know I'm a faster runner than Peter. <laughs> and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple, who had first come to the tomb, then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. And so as she wept, She stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Exactly what the angel said. Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means my teacher. Jesus said to her, Stop clinging to me. So she obviously was, For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and to your Father, my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came, announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. A misunderstood woman in this story. In all of the Gospels, Mary Magdalene is the first to the tomb on Sunday. Why do I say she's misunderstood? It's behind the scenes and lost in church tradition, but there has been a church tradition that is outside of the scriptural account that attaches Mary Magdalene to the reputation of a prostitute. A lot of people think that Mary Magdalene was a former prostitute and that she's perhaps connected even to the unnamed woman in John 8, at the end of John 7 and John 8, that gets caught in adultery, brought before Jesus. They said, are you going to stone her or not? And Jesus says, you know, who is without sin, let them cast the first stone, and they all go away. And he says, where are your accusers? They're not here. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Unnamed anonymous woman, no connection to Mary Magdalene, but church tradition has. I'll tell you the only detail we get about Mary Magdalene, other than she's from Galilee, from the city of Migdala, so that's her surname, is Mary of Migdala, Mary the Magdalene, is from Luke chapter eight, verse two. Mary Magdalene was there, of whom Jesus cast out seven demons. That's the only detail we get, and I would submit to you that's the only detail we need to know perhaps why she was the first to the tomb on Sunday morning. How can you, in your mind, begin to understand the kind of love and gratitude this woman had for Jesus based on her past, based on what he rescued her from? Can you imagine what kind of connection she had, and I can see it in the story because she goes in and sees angels that Peter and John didn't see, and then she's outside of the tomb weeping. She's weeping so much, she's one of those ugly cries, that she can't see Jesus. Jesus is standing there. He speaks to her. She looks, but she can't see. I can feel and see the story in your mind, can you? She's weeping so hard that she doesn't recognize who he is. But it's not until the good shepherd calls the name of the sheep that she sees. He says, Mary. And then all of a sudden, she notices, she sees. I'd like to capture your mind with some art. This first piece of art is of the resurrection of Jesus. It's by Ron Disiani. It does no justice on the screen because this actual mural painting is over 12 feet tall and 40 feet wide. It's life-size people. 
It's at the moment that Jesus comes out of the tomb. You understand the stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that we could tell he was no longer there. He comes out. If you'll notice, there are the keys of death in Hades on his hip. And power is emanating. Angels are there in the front. Roman soldiers on the ground. And then in their presence on either side of them, all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the prophets, Esther, the king, David, and Solomon, all there in presence in a spiritual way, recognizing and promoting this event of Jesus as the central event. You must see this at one of the biblical museums in Dallas, Texas, if you're ever there. It is uh, amazing. It is amazing. This next one is more humble in comparison. It's James Tissot, one of my favorites. We shared to you some of his art on Friday and last Sunday. The moment that Jesus comes out of a tune, obviously he pictures it very differently. All the Roman soldiers and the chief priests and guards there on the ground reacting. But this third one is, of course, our story, also by James Tissot. Mary Magdalene on the ground, clinging to the feet of Jesus. He says, woman, stop clinging to me, for I have yet to ascend to my father, but I will. And so go tell the brethren that I ascend to my father and their father, to my God and their God. Go and tell them what you have seen. A woman, a misunderstood woman, is the first to witness the resurrected Jesus. I love it. I love it. She says to us that all who are hurt and hungry for rest and healing, for all of the traumatized, for all of the wounded, for all of you who are misunderstood, you are welcomed to the risen Jesus with grace. You are welcomed. And he meets this woman who has a story. Oh, I wish we had more of her story. Who has a story? And Jesus entered into that story by faith and rescued her. Oh, hungry. I think she was hungry. I think that's why she was there. I remember a man named Mike, whom I met once and I spoke to once. Um, and years after I met him and he spoke to me one time, I was on a date with my wife to Cheesecake Factory. Now you know a little bit my style. Um, <laughs> we were sitting in the booth and a friend of mine texted me that Mike had died in a tragic car accident long before he should have. I'd met him once, he spoke to me once. And I began to weep at the table because of how powerful that one statement was. It was many, many years before that. I was tired in ministry. I was hungry for rest. Uh, and I was going to a conference that my boss said, hey, we're all gonna go to the conference. I was like, great, I'm exhausted, but sounds great, all right? And he was like, besides the main sessions, I want you to sign up for all the breakout sessions. I was like, I don't really wanna sign up for the breakout sessions. He's like, you have to. I was like, okay. Uh, I looked on the list of breakout sessions. Mike says, are you tired? I was like, yeah. He said, are you hungry for rest? I said, yeah. He said, come to this session. It's just a spiritual retreat, and it fills up every block of all the breakout sessions. I was like, hallelujah, Jesus. So I signed up, and I went. It was glorious. On the very last session, we had communion together, and Mike was up front holding this huge chunk of bread. And as one by one they came up, he said something to each of them. I don't know what he said to everybody else, but I remember what he said to me. He called me by name because I had a name tag on and it was more important. He said to me as I took a very large piece of that bread, he looked me in the eyes and he said, Scott, never stop running and plaguing in the grace of God and never be hungry again. One moment, one word, and it changed something in me. When Mary, hungry for redemption and rescue and rest, when she first laid her eyes on Jesus and put faith in him and then walked with him likely for many, many years, that hunger was met, and that's why she was at the tomb first. I'm convinced. I'm convinced.
That's the misunderstood woman. What about the mischaracterized man? We continue the story with another man that is remembered for all the wrong things. His name is Thomas. Let's look at John 20, starting in verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the very first Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, you remember, they are very scared. They have no idea what's going on. We have some reports that Jesus is alive. He's not in the tomb. People are confused. They're frustrated. We have no idea what's happening. Perhaps the Jews who killed Jesus are coming after us. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. He's giving them his authority. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, so this is the next Sunday, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them this time and Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst again. This is supernatural. He just appears and he says, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, come here. Come here, my son. Reach in here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God the highest human praise in all of the Gospels is from Thomas, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. Let me show you an image from Michelangelo, not the uh, one you think of, but Michelangelo Caravaggio, one of my favorite biblical painters and artists. This is a famous scene from him about who we know as Doubting Thomas. Thomas, in this very event, putting his hand into the wounded and healed side of Jesus. Thomas gets a bad rap. We call him Doubting Thomas. Most people recognize Thomas. Oh, yeah, the one who doubted. I want you to know a couple of things. First, in all of the other Gospels, None of the disciples believe the first reports of Jesus' resurrection. None of them do. They're all like, yeah, I don't know. How could these things be? And second, you need to know that Thomas is more alike you and I than we probably admit. None of the synoptic gospels give us any account of Thomas. Matthew, Mark, and Luke only list his name when they tell us of all the disciples. Only John gives us a picture of who Thomas is, probably setting us up for this moment here. The first time we see Thomas is in John 11. John 11 is when Jesus comes and raises Lazarus from the dead after he's been in the tomb four days. You may not know that the Jews had an idea that the spirit of a deceased person hovered around the body for three days until it ascended to God in hopes of resuscitation or resurrection. That's why Jesus came on day four, because it's completely hopeless. To the Jew, it's completely hopeless. And Jesus came, and he came not only to raise Lazarus from the dead as the great pinnacle of the miracles foreshadowing his own resurrection coming, but he also entered into the Jerusalem vicinity of great danger. All of the disciples knew that the Jewish leadership, Pharisees, scribes, they were hunting for Jesus. They were waiting to seize him and to kill him so that when Jesus tells his disciples in John 11, let us go up to Jerusalem, Thomas is the one who looks at the other boys and he says, well, let's go and die with him. This is a statement of great courage, great courage coming from Thomas. The second time we see him is in The Last Supper room, after Judas had already gone, Jesus begins to share with the 11 believing men and the women there all of his hopes for life after he has left them in the flesh. One of the things he says is, 
You'll know, you know the way I am going. And Thomas says and lifts his hand, we don't know the way. Can you tell us the way? And Jesus responds to a great question with, I am the way, Thomas, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And then we hear of Thomas in John 20. Unless I see the nail prints and touch them with my hand and put his hand, my hand in his side, I will not believe. And then Jesus comes. Notice in the story, there is no rebuke from Jesus. He does not say, shame on you, Thomas, for not believing. He welcomes. And I want you to hear, friend, all who might be doubting, who might be confused, who might be mischaracterized, you are welcome to the risen Jesus with love. You're welcome to the risen Jesus with acceptance. This misunderstood woman, this mischaracterized man stands in many ways as two stories on the spectrum of all your stories and mine, as representative for us to say, if Mary was welcome, so are you. If Thomas was welcome, so are you. The resurrected Jesus welcomes all with grace and love, and it's beautiful. I want you to remember the last statement that Jesus tells Thomas, because it's really important for you and me. He says, because you have seen me, do you believe? And then he talks about you and me, Jesus does, when he says to Thomas, he says, Thomas, because you've touched my hands, do you believe? He says this, listen, blessed are they who did not see but still believed. See, that's you and me. I haven't had the opportunity, nor have you, to physically touch the scars and the wounds of Jesus. I haven't yet met him in the flesh. Thomas did, and he believed with no rebuke no rebuke at all. Jesus says, yes, good, but blessed are they who have not had that opportunity and yet still believe. That's an invitation to you, friend. That's an invitation to all of us. Here's the big idea I need you to recognize, that the empty tomb of Jesus reverberates a reality in every heart. All that Jesus said was true. All that Jesus said was true. So those thoughts that may have gone through their mind the first moment their eyes opened on that Sunday before they realized what had happened, did Jesus really speak the truth when he says, if you believe in me, you have eternal life and you've crossed over from death to life? Yes. When Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life and you believe in me, even when you die, you'll live and in living, you'll never die. Was that true? Yes. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, was he saying the truth? Yes. When Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because the Father is in me and I am in him and you are in me by faith. Was that true? Yes. The empty tomb reverberates, I think, in every heart. The reality of this simple idea, all that Jesus said was true. Friend, I need you to hear. Yet those who have not seen, blessed are you if you believe. It's an invitation, and I want to extend an invitation to you. If you're a believer in Jesus, you're a disciple and follower of Jesus today, I want to invite you to more faith, to deeper intimacy with Jesus based on the reality of the empty tomb. I want to invite you, just as he would, come closer, come nearer, have more of my heart in yours. I want it and you want it. And I invite you, friend. To those who may be on the outside, maybe you've never really understood, for those of you who, like me, perhaps attended church for a long time, two decades, I was in church every Sunday, sometimes multiple times a week. Listen, I believe that God existed. As a, what I thought was a smart kid, I understood the world around me and science enough to know that this is not an accident. God must exist. There must be an intelligent designer, at least behind all of this. I believe that Jesus existed in history, that he was a person in history, probably died on the cross. I wasn't sure about the resurrection because that was weird to me, never seen that before. But I didn't understand why he died until I was 19 years old and good, godly men and women surrounded me and someone first opened the scriptures to me and said, 
you have been just trying to do better because that's what I thought of God. I thought of God in the heaven with his arms crossed, his brow furrowed, looking down at me, just saying, Scott, I'm so disappointed. I'm disgusted, actually. Do better. You must do better. And I kept thinking, I know I must do better, but I can't. No matter how hard I try, and I was a good kid, no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to do better. Until these men and women sat with me and said, Scott, it's really not about doing better because you can't ever be good enough. The standard isn't better. It's actually perfect, 100%, 100% of the time. And there's no possible way you can reach that standard. And I was like, that's great news. Thanks so much. Why did I come? I appreciate that. So I'm hopeless. Yeah, you're hopeless. Okay, fantastic. They said, but that's not the end of the story. This is why the eternal son of God came into history lived a perfect life, and died on the cross willingly. His life wasn't taken. He willingly laid it down. Why? So that he could pay the penalty for your imperfection and give you his perfection and forgive you and call you his own, adopt you into his family, redeem and welcome you in. That's the gospel message. And I invite you to it today because the empty tomb proves, friend, all Jesus said was true. All that Jesus said is true. And it's true for you. I welcome you in. I have one final image that I want to share. It may be my favorite piece of art of all of the art that I have loved for a very long time. It's a very ancient image. And this is a version of very, very many. It's a Byzantine style icon, very two-dimensional, very on brand for how they did things in those days. The Byzantine era is somewhere around the second or third century. Depending on a part of the world, it extends on into the 12th or 13th century of Christians expanding, trying to teach illiterate people the gospel and the Bible. This is a story. Can you see Jesus in the middle? Obviously. I want you to think about who might he be holding on to. There's obviously a man and the woman at the bottom. I want you to just think, not out loud, just think to yourself, what's happening in this picture? Many of the Byzantine icons, I need to tell you, are not images of an event in the scripture, and this is not an event. You will find no event analogous to this picture in the New Testament, because they don't they aren't only interested in events, they're interested in theology. This is a picture of theology. On the very top in Greek, ha or he anastasis, the resurrection. This doesn't look like the resurrection of Jesus because it's not the event, it's the theology. Jesus is in the center. Around his halo, you can maybe make out a Greek sentence where at least there's three Greek letters that make a sentence. It's ha on, the one being, um, which is analogous to Exodus chapter three, verse 14, where God says to Moses, I am who I am, that's my name. And Jesus, this Greek sentence in his halo is I am. The threefold blue emanation behind him is representative of the Trinity. He seems to be holding the hands of people that are coming out of a tomb. I wonder who, mo- who might those be. Um, behind him is the Mount of Olives. It's separated into two. It's split. Because in Zechariah it says when Jesus returns, he will step his foot on the Mount of Olives it will split in two from east to west or north to south. Who is he raising out of the tombs? Well, it's Adam and Eve. He's standing on the gates of hell itself. And underneath, in the darkness, that's why he's painted dark, is Satan bound. And all around Satan are broken chains and open locks. This is the theology of the resurrection. To Jesus' right, David, Solomon, and John the Baptist pointing to Jesus. To Jesus' left, three of his disciples. This is the reality. It's not a myth. It's a reality. It's not an event. It's a theology. But the reality of this picture is that the resurrection of Jesus reverberates all the way back to the beginning and then all the way to the end and everything in between. 
standing on the gates of hell, open chains and locks, death and Satan bound in the darkness beneath him. Adam and Eve lifted out of their tombs. Does it get any better than that? I submit to you that the empty tomb reverberates a reality in every heart that all that Jesus said was true. It's true for you. It's still an invitation to you. And for all in the room, I invite you. I invite you with the words that meant so much to me. Would you come to Jesus? And when you come, never, ever stop running and playing in the grace of God and never be hungry again. Can I pray for you? Would you pray with me? Father, we bless you. We love you. We need you. We're desperate for you. And for those in the room who have already put their faith in Jesus, I pray for them that their intimacy with you would deepen, their faith would widen, that their hearts would be more sensitive, that their minds would be more open, that you would transform them even more into the likeness of your son. For those many perhaps in the room or tuning in online who have never understood, perhaps like me, they were religious, they were committed, but they never understood the reality of a relationship, of the truth of it all. In the quietness of their heart, perhaps you would even pray with me like this, God, I believe you now, I understand. And even though I may not understand at all, I may continue to have some doubts, I believe. I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died on the cross to forgive me of my sins and that he rose from the dead to prove that all that he said was true and I receive it. Thank you, God. I accept your free gift of grace in salvation and forgiveness and redemption. I accept it. And then the next statement could be, thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for your endless love for me. Thank you for new life. Thank you that today is not only the day that we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, but because of my faith in this moment, that today is my resurrection day too. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.